wore my special Black History Month shirt, and, and then I'm so zoomed in, no one can see it anyway. So <laughs> I can just see the top of it. I, I could have just worn, you know, any old t-shirt. I didn't. <laughs> That's funny. And I'll just let everybody know as they are coming in that we are recording this. this yes. So, yep. And I think we'll get started. So awesome. uh, good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Joseph Riccio, and I am the Associate Director and Director of Visitor Engagement at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum. Thank you all for being here today for Serving Up History. I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker, community historian, John Mills. John will give us an update on his extensive research into the life of Prince Mortimer, a slave from Guinea who was brought to New England in 1730 when he was six years old and died at the age of 110 in 1834 while serving a life sentence at the Wethersfield prison. John has advocated on behalf of Prince Mortimer and other individuals with similar untold stories to ensure that their stories are heard and remembered. John is a technologist by trade, but a genealogist and equity advocate by passion the descendant of both Southern and Northern slaves, as well as the descendant of slaveholders due to their relationships with female slaves. He focuses on unearthing little known people and stories of this country's history in slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. Learn more about John's work at um, alexbrianne.org. And thank you for being with us today and welcome John. Thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate the um, introduction. Uh, let me let me go in and share my presentation. Uh, give me a second. I probably should have had this already, right? <laughs> Windows show that. Sorry about that. That. This would be all ready to go. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. All right. Hopefully everybody can see the presentation um, on the screen. Um, let me know if you, you can't. And um, thank you, Cynthia, for that, that, that introduction. Um, and yeah, the, the story of Prince Mortimer is one that I, I'm really passionate about, specifically because, um, you know, I've done a lot of research into my own genealogy, and specifically my sister has done a lot of research into it. And learning about that gave us some answers to some of the dynamics of how we kind of present in the world in this country. But not only us, but um, how we um, felt we were kind of, uh, others kind of perceive themselves or, or perceive African-Americans. So we thought, and I thought that kind of telling stories like the one of Prince might be helpful not only for us, but you know, for for everyone to kind of you know, understand the, you know, the the path of the enslaved, and it might uh, create some mechanism for in, you know, from internal looking inside and each other, and all of us um, towards our own unconscious biases. So um, that's what it's all about. I'm originally from San Diego, moved to Connecticut in 1998. I'm a husband, father, grandfather. I kind of identify from that perspective. Um, and again, I'm kind of always kind of working towards kind of supporting my family. Um, my sister's work took us a lot of places and we found a lot of things, commonly lost souls that we were related to, um, that were buried under parking lots or in, in, in the woods behind whites only cemeteries. And, you know, it, it always kind of struck us in our heart. Again, another reason why I, I kind of do this work to, because I see people in history that are kind of unknown, right? They're kind of in the shadows, but I think their stories could um, inspire and, and I think their stories resonate. So that's really what this is about, telling some of these stories from an African-American perspective, specifically someone who um, knows and is clear about kind of their linkage to, to, to slavery. Um, Prince Mortimer, we first kind of learned about who he was by a book that was written in 1844 by an individual named Richard Phelps. To give you kind of a brief synopsis of his story, he was brought here on a, on a slave ship um, in the um, early 1730s. Um, 
He was enslaved by a person by the name of Philip Mortimer in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, he worked there most of his life. Um, he was a servant to many officers of the Revolutionary War. One of those officers was George Washington. And what Richard Phelps wrote about in his book, which wasn't really about Prince, it was about Newgate Prison, and Prince just happened to be one of the inmates. He, he states that he was um, there because he attempted to poison his enslaver um, and therefore was sent to um, Newgate Prison for life at age 87, and he stayed um, in prison until 110. He ultimately died at Weathersfield Prison because Newgate Prison closed down. They moved all the prisoners to Weathersfield in 1827, and he died at Weathersfield Prison. So that was the story Richard Phelps told. So from 1844 to 2006, nothing else was ever really written about Prince. So like, you know, 162 years passed, you know, nothing's really written about him. But also, um, nothing was really written about Prince Pryor either. You know, you've got information from 1794 when his first enslaver passed away. He's in the will, but that's about it. He's like kind of a ghost, right? So in 2006, Dennis Karen decides to write a book to try to get into greater detail. He found some really interesting things. You know, he discovered that, you know, that, that first enslaver, um, um, Philip Mortimer, um, actually was attempting to free Prince in his will when he passed in 1794. But the son-in-law challenged the will and thus the, the first enslaver passed away. The son-in-law, his name was George Starr, ends up being the enslaver. Now Prince is enslaved to George Starr when he thought he was about to be free. So that's kind of some additional information, some context you get out of um, Dennis Karen's book, along with more about kind of the town and the time that Prince lived in, but still, you know, for me, I was looking for like more granularity around who Prince was, again, aligning to kind of my past. So I just kept digging. Also, when I looked at the initial documentation in Richard Phelps's book, it, I, there were like patterns in there that I saw in my own genealogy, lost cemeteries, colorism is in there. He talked about how dark he was, um, the trauma of being brought here from another country, lack of documentation about him. You know, he's just like lost. Um, he was incarcerated. Um, and then my research outside of those two books, I started realizing there's broader stuff here. There's like generational wealth. These guys that, that, that were his enslavers had like political influence. So I was finding that. Um, so I kept digging. And for the past year, let's give just some of the updates that I found over the last year. Um, one of which was in his, his enslaver, uh, Philip Mortimer, was born and raised is in Ireland. And it was supposed in the previous two books that he came to this country in 1736 by himself, married, and then moved to Middletown, Connecticut, because there were it's like a port there and there were shipmakers, but they didn't have means to make rope. They were like, uh, pu pu pulling those things in from New Haven or from Boston. So he moved to Middletown to create this rope walk where he would write, make rope to sell to all the, 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 the uh, ship's captains. Um, but what I learned is that wasn't actually the case. He actually had a brother named James and, a, and James had a wife named Hannah and he had another brother named Peter. And they all died within a week of each other in 1773 in Boston. Um, James seemed to be very wealthy. So now I believe like Philip really was kind of just kind of using some of James Mortimer's money to kind of build out his own prospects in Connecticut. Um, uh, and I also think that these, these folks kind of died of um, smallpox epidemic of that time. Also, Philip Mortimer's wife died in 1773 as well. So it's like his old family that he came here from Ireland with passed away. But it gave me another path to kind of look for prints. I'm like, well, we can't find any documentation on prints. Maybe there's documentation in these guys' wills. I didn't find anything there, but I, I did find that James was incredibly wealthy. He was he, he was so wealthy, he owned an island, an island that set, sat out in Boston Harbor. It was called Apple Island. It doesn't exist today. The city of Boston filled in the, 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 um, the waters from the mainland to Apple Island back in 1949 so that they can expand Logan Airport. And so now Apple Island is like the tip of runway 27 at Logan International Airport. But um, it just it just was an, an indication of like where all of this money really was coming from. I think it was from Philip Motorber's older brother, James. Again, these I, I in when you're doing this type of research, when you're talking about enslaved people, you really have to start following, you know, their enslavers because the enslaved person isn't really documented. So that's why I'm like following the enslavers, but um, uh, 
This ended up kind of being a dead end. He, it didn't seem like he was ever owned by any of these people. Um, so then I, I, I came back to like um, this town where Phil, uh, uh, Prince Mortimer was enslaved. I would, had historically been looking at records of a church called Christ Church in Middletown, which is where the enslaver, Philip Mortimer, brought all his slaves. So I, I can see records dating back to 1752, all the way up till his death in 1794, where he's having his slaves baptized and you're seeing in, uh, different events relative to his enslaved at that church. So I just stuck with records at Christ Church. I never really even thought to look at other churches in that same small town. I, I finally did one day, I, I looked at First Congreg Congregational Church, Christ Church being like an Episcopal church, First Congregational was like one started by Puritans. And I checked it out and right in the notes in 1768 is an enslaved person named Prince owned by a completely different person named George Phillips. So now I'm actually thinking that um, Prince was actually, uh, or Philip Mortimer was actually his second enslaver. I think George Phillips was his first and he was either sold or passed on to Philip Mortimer, my case kind of meant made a little stronger when I discovered that there was um, when when um, uh, George Phillips passed away in 1778. Philip Mortimer, the enslaver, I, the only enslaver I knew of, is a part of the administration of his estate, and he's doing the distribution of all of this guy's property. So it kind of aligns for me that um, I think, for instance, that record I see in that church record is kind of it is the prince I'm looking for and George Phillips was actually his his first enslaver. Also um, I found a map over the past year, a map of the town of Middletown, Connecticut, which I had the oldest map I've ever seen doing some digging and I found it at the Connecticut State Library from 1783 and it shows that rope walk. Uh, um, and it, which is wild to me. It's like a thousand feet long. It's like the oddest looking building ever. But I, I, I found that fascinating. And that allowed me to pinpoint exactly where the rope walk would be today. I also found where Philip Mortimer lived and the street to get to his house. And it was able to meet, allow me to pinpoint exactly where those like, locations are today as well. Also, I found, which is what's fascinating for me this year, I found like um, ho hospital, prison hospital records from Weathersfield prison, the second prison Prince was in. Um, what's fascinating about these records is at this time, the records are only, only go from 1829 to 1831. And that was during a time when the prison warden and a gentleman named Pillsbury was being investigated because he was like, it was a complaint that he was starving prisoners and treating them inappropriately, specifically not giving them fresh water, or, um, food that had uh, been contaminated. And so lots of prisoners were getting sick or dying. Um, and so you can find records of that, but I never really knew how that um, affected Prince. Well, in finding these hospital records, Prince spent, I, I, I notated over many months, Prince spent most of 1830 in the hospital. He dies in 1834, but 1830, when this investigation was going on and the state had doctors there that had to report back to the state on what was going on, I found records where they were like saying, well, Pint, Prince is complaining of bowel issues um, or the way, what we need to do as a prescription to solve his issues is he needs better food. So it's interesting to read all this stuff. Like he, he was truly tormented, right? Also while, was, while he was in prison, um, which is amazing to me that he survived that as well and lived to be 110 and died years after these events. Um, I also found um, a book uh, called A Traffic of Dead Bodies that talks about that time period and when uh, medical science was trying to evolve based on doing dissections and they couldn't figure out how to get bodies. So they were like grave digging, digging basically, basically students from universities would just at the middle of the night literally go into graves and dig up bodies. And most of the time people didn't complain about it. They were like, whatever, when they were like transients or you know homeless. But in Connecticut, that happened with a, uh, a young white woman in um, West Haven, Connecticut. Her name was Bathsheba Smith. And when it happened, the next morning, her father found out about it, complained, the town rioted, and uh, they went to the um, Yale School of Medicine, um, where the, 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 the uh, medical school that was in that area, and they went to Jonathan Knight, who was the head of anatomy at that school, and underneath floorboards in his classroom, there they found Bathsheba Smith, right? So um, 
So that caused Connecticut to pass laws. They were like, okay, now that this has happened to a person that we show a value that we can't let this happen ever again. So they enacted a law um, in 1824 where, okay, it's illegal to dig up bodies. You can't do that anymore. But what you can do is you can get bodies from prison. So if somebody dies in a prison uh, and they don't have any family, then then you're obligated and the, the state um, university can take that body. And so from that point forward, Yale was like, checking to see he was dying at you know the state prison um and which leads me into like my my belief is I, previously i believe that he was prince mortimer was buried in the prison cemetery in weathersfield that's a very small space it was lost for years buried it's underneath a park today but i'm um, working with the state of connecticut and working with uh, uh, folks at yale university they've been helping helping me tremendously i think we've all come to the conclusion that when he died he's not buried anywhere his body was sent to Yale University and he was dissected and discarded so we don't we don't really know where he is but the 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 slide I'm showing you now is a slide that I um, of uh, muster rolls that I found um, during the Revolutionary War the one on the right is of a person named Jonathan Knight the same name as the person who ran the uh, anatomy part of this Yale Medical School back um, uh, during the time that that Prince would have been dissected right but you know this record is from many years prior to that. So, but the name struck me. I'm like, this is odd. That's the same name, and this guy's considered to be a surgeon's mate, and he was in the Connecticut Fourth, which was in the Revolutionary that went to um, Valley Forge with George Washington, and I, we knew that Prince Mortimer also was, according to him, at Valley Forge with George Washington, and we have records of a prince that we we're not sure if it's Prince Mortimer that's in the Connecticut Fifth, which was also at Valley Forge with, with um, George Washington. And so I started going like, well, who is this Jonathan Knight guy? Like, wait a minute, this name. Turns out he's the father. So it just was ironic that like the father of this individual may have served alongside Prince in the Revolutionary War. And years later, the son is dissecting him at Yale University. Um, all of that um, kind of gave me some new kind of items to add to this list of things that I think kind of align today. You know, the things we talked about earlier that I saw in the story, now it, it aligned to like inequities in healthcare, not specifically around culture, you know, he was just because he was in prison, but also inequities in medical research, right, based on whether you're poor and, and didn't have family or, or, or those elements. And so it kind of aligned to things that I've seen relative to my own kind of uh, life experience. Um, and I hear more broadly with regards to the context of our country today from an African-American experience perspective. Um, so anyways, in working with the Connecticut Freedom Trail, um, they, are, they have agreed to create like a Prince Mortimer Trail in Connecticut. And I'm really excited about that. I gave them a lot of these locations where they, I think they can put, put their state pillar and state emblem, um, where he, the location of where, you know, based on that 1783 map, I knew the location of where he uh, lived, the location where he worked, the location of the church where his kids were born, the location of the prisons where he was in, but also, um, you know, the state suggested maybe we should like put, you know, an honored part of the Prince Mortimer Trail at Yale Medical School. So that's on the list. I'm excited to, you know, get that going. So more to come on that. Um, but also more amazingly, the state got me in contact with um, uh, uh, an in individual named J.R. Carnegie, oh, I knew I was going to forget his name, <laughs> Hargraves, J.R. Carnegie Hargraves. And um, he is a developer in Middletown, Connecticut, and he's building out the space where the um, rope walk used to be, where Prince um, used to work. And I contacted him. He was fascinated by the story. He's in the middle of like finishing up planning and about ready to kind of start the building of affordable housing, um, affordable office space um, in that, in that, uh, on that property. And he's talking about working with us to build like a small area that we're, for seating that we would call something like Prince Mortimer Park, murals, plaques, um, lots of stuff on the property, just honoring Prince Mortimer. So we're working with him. We're all excited about that. The picture on the left, um, is uh, Dr. Jesse Nasa, who works at, uh, in African American Studies at Wesleyan University, that, who was also on board helping us figure out how we're going to honor Prince in this space. So I'm uh, incredibly excited about that work. Um, another one other thing about this story in, in the state of Connecticut, I know we we honor often the story of Venture Smith and how um, he, you know, he 
came over here as well in a similar fashion and eventually got out of freedom and was able to build, you know, wealth and property and, you know, eventually had his story told he had it dictated and uh, he has a slave narrative. But I wanted to, I, 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 I feel as though we should be kind of celebrating Prince in a similar way. Their stories marry and then diverge at a very critical point. If you kind of look at it, they're born, born around the same time. They come from the same country. They came here and were enslaved around the same time. They were enslaved for the largest majority of their life in the same um, US colony. They had the same kind of messages about their trip here on the slave ship. You know, Venture Smith saying there was great mortality from smallpox on the ship. Prince Mortimer talking about how filthy the ship was. Um, Venture was a little taller. We know Venture's weight, but we don't know Prince's. They had the same number of, of children. They had actually the same number of enslavers if you consider the state was one of Prince Mortimer's enslavers. And um, they were both promised freedom. Where their stories diverge is when you talk about the realization of it. Like the, the, the enslaver eventually went along with what he said for venture he got his freedom that didn't happen for prince so their stories start to diverge um but i i, I to me that that matters less i think prince motors is more of the the common story i think ventures is a more of an exceptional story and i just want to have them highlighted in this country because of the similarities before that divergence in, in a similar way so that's kind of the work that I'm doing, I've done a lot on it, trying to get to that place. The person on the right in this picture, that's Dennis Karen. He's the writer of the book um, from 2006. And we've talked often, I'm keeping him up to speed on what we're doing. Um, the middle is a trip I took last year to um, DC because there's some of these records you can only get if you go to the Library of Congress. And so I, I'm there um, and I've been at the Beinecke Library at Yale many times trying to dig deeper into the story. So the journey kind of continues. Um, if you want to be a part of the effort, we welcome anybody who wants to help and be a part of it. Um, you can go to alexbrian.org. It's a, um, a 501c3 nonprofit that I started. It's named after my youngest daughter who um, nearly died um, from an overdose. Um, well, I actually call a poisoning of fentanyl. Um, and she wasn't supposed to make it. She wasn't supposed to live. They asked us to pull the plug. And um, the day we were going in and they were gonna trans, they were planning to kind of transfer her organs to other, from, as, a, as a donor, she started to move. And so that's the only way she's, and she's alive. And so I named the organization after her. Um, and, and again, if it's a site, support us if, uh, if that's something that she'd like to do. Um, and with that, um, any questions? So we do have a question, um, and John, that was that was awesome. Thank you so much for keeping us up to date on you know Prince Mortimer and and the story. Um, we have a question. It says your work is fascinating, John. Thank you so much. Do you have any plans to write a book about your story and research? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of work on that. It's just time now. Like we're 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 looking to produce a. Um, a one-man show with regards to Prince. So that, that's in the works. We're like writing that as we speak. And we're trying to collect funds to like pay for the work. Um, so that's happening. Um, I've, got, I've got talks with a director about maybe doing like a short film. And yeah, I want to write a book that's kind of broader. It really kind of talking to kind of my life experience and then how it connects to these type of stories, thus how they can help us all. Like, so... Yeah, that's something I want to do. I just, it's time, still working on it. <laughs> um, another question, is there a way to dig into the Yale school records to see what happened? Yeah, we, and I, I've done that. Um, and, and we've been, uh, that's what I've been doing a lot of, like spending a lot. And when you know what's fascinating, the folks at Yale have been amazing in helping me and directing me at where to look. And they've done some of the research for me and they'll say, hey, John, we think we found this. And then I'll go down there and look at, it's, it's been incredibly a supportive um, thing. Um, but unfortunately, we would have to trace money, right? Because they, they didn't, there were names, no names attached to these people that were, they were taken in as donations. So we'd have to trace how, who was paying for the transport and align it for the same timeline that Prince was sent there. And that's the struggle. So we're, we're trying to figure that out. Right. It's hard. I mean, I imagine it's hard finding a lot of these records because they, they're almost non-existent. Right. Right. Um, let's see. Can you expand on some of the challenges you faced in trying to get access to records, whether at local municipalities, 
and or the Library of Congress? Yeah, it, it's not really a challenge at getting at the records. Like I've been at the St Connecticut State Library more times than I can imagine. Now they just say, hey, John, I mean, they just know who I am. But it's not really about getting access to the records. It's, re it's really, do the records exist? Like the, 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 the issue is, you know, at that time, it's, it's a lack of documentation thing. And it's not just prints. It's like African-Americans prior to the Civil War. It's like they weren't considered human until, you know, the 14th Amendment. So anything prior to that, you know, it, it just doesn't exist. So you're trying to align to, you know, those that were considered valuable, you know, their enslaver, and then just hoping that in documenting the enslaver, the enslaver mentions the enslaved, right? It, that's the struggle. It's not really getting access to it. It's just, does it even exist? Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, is there um, any way to confirm that it was Prince in the Connecticut Fourth at Valley Forge? Yeah, that's a tough one because see, Prince was a, a more or less common name, you know, but so you, it, it, you'd you have to, again, back to that point, you'd have to align Prince to his enslaver. Unfortunately, at that time, if you were enslaved, like that was like, that was disrespectful to use as your surname, the enslaver's name. Like it wouldn't have been Prince Mortimer while he was enslaved, which is why on those records, these enslaved are, are Prince Negro or whomever Negro, they're not, right? So because you're enslaved, so they're not using the surname, I don't have a tie to the surname. I got to get him tied to the enslaver. And then I could confirm it. But again, there just may not be the documentation to make that definitive um, identification. We may have to just rely on those were Prince's words. He said I was there, right? And it's whether or not you want to believe that or not in, mm -hmm. in as to whether or not you want to honor him. Right? Um, a, a compliment here, John, your research has progressed so far and you are bringing in many aspects to follow. It's very exciting and very important historically. Well done from Ann Burton. Um, oh, Let's see, can you recap the story of the crime Prince Mortimer was accused of? Poison the son-in-law of previous owner. Was this real or did the son-in-law want to find a way to get rid of an elderly enslaved man? I think it was more, it, it, just a, a personal opinion. I think that at the time, these people were very well, you know, they were popular people. Uh, his enslaver at the time, George Starr, you know, with you know, the tailor who made boots for the, the Revolutionary War. And George Washington had sent him a letter asking for more boots. And that's in the Library of Congress. I, and, and he's very wealthy. He, he contributed to the building of the first courthouse in Middletown, Connecticut. So I think, and at the time, in 1811, when Prince was convicted, the largest slave um, re revolt in US history occurred. So I just think at the time, enslavers were in fear of what the enslaved may do to them in their sleep. Right, I think there was a fear, and I think this guy had power. So whether he actually put arsenic in this guy's morning chocolate and then tried to serve it to him, I think it's questionable. I don't know. He may have just heard about this slave revolt and was scared to death and thought he saw something in his coffee, and then, and since he had influence, he like paid for the local courthouse. He was in local politics. He was wealthy. Like he was going to be convicted. So I don't, you know. 87 year old guy goes to prison for life. I think all those things are at play. So I don't really know what really happened, but I think all of that's at play. So we'll take uh, just a couple uh, couple more. Um, these two are um, sort of a, a little bit um, related. Are there any known descendants? And have you done any DNA tracing to learn more about Prince and his family? Yeah, dig it into that. I got I've traced Philip Mortimer, the enslaver's family, all the way up to the day. There's Philip Mort people named Philip Mortimer today that they descend from him. I've traced and talked to them, but they don't have any records to help me. Um, um, and yeah, Prince had three kids. Um, and I know where one of them moved to, but into New York. But once he gets there, I can't, I can't find or her. Once she gets there, I can't find her. So that's that's more to come. I'm digging. We're gonna figure it out. Um, let's see. I think um. I think most everything, because um, there were some questions that were very similar. Um, so um, John, on behalf of the museum and the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in the state of Connecticut, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we are excited to welcome you back in June for um, an expanded in-person um, talk on Prince. So stay tuned for more details on that. And if you enjoyed this program, please consider making 
a gift to the museum at wdsmuseum.org to help us to continue to offer free and affordable community events. And join us for next week's Serving Up History, which is Madison's America. Is it possible to sustain democracy in the 21st century on February 16th? So thank you all for being here today. And John, thank you again for um, your continuous research on Prince Mortimer. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.